It's a pleasure to welcome you uh, to this Instruct Eric Celebration of Achievements. My name is Joel Sussman. I'm the co-director of the Instruct Eric Center in Israel, and I'll be the chair today. I've been involved with Instruct really from its earliest days. Instruct started over a decade ago as one of the six pioneering S-free biomedical sciences infrastructures. At that time, the intention that Europe should establish a long-term biomedical infrastructure set of projects appeared perhaps to somewhat naive. But in fact, these infrastructures have proved to be of immense benefit for Europe and are serving as models for the entire world. Instruct Eric specifically is a pan-European distributed research infrastructure that makes high-end technologies and methodologies and structural biology available to scientists and students throughout Europe. In addition, its very existence has created productive synergies between groups of scientists using very different techniques so as to achieve a result that would not have otherwise been possible. To get a feeling for how this has happened, we'd like to show them six welcoming comments in a short video that will be played right now. It's a real pleasure to contribute to this celebration and to take this opportunity to express my warmest greetings to Instruct. I always had to honestly recognize the remarkable work done by Instruct from the early days, providing access to the best instrumentation in the field, but also scientific, technical, financial support to a wide community of users around Europe and beyond. Instructeric benefits from the relentless support of Dave, its director, and Suzanne, its coordinator, from the hub, the various committees, and of course, the member representatives of the Council. The involvement of all actors at every step is extremely useful and makes the task of the chair not only simpler, but extremely rewarding. They all deserve my warmest congratulations and thanks. My involvement with Instruct dates back to 2009, when Dave asked me to join the Scientific Advisory Board. Here we are, more than a decade later, with Instruct Eric firmly established as the pan-European provider of structural biology research infrastructure. Your organization has succeeded admirably by enabling broad access to cutting edge methods that are helping to promote innovation in the biomedical sciences around the world. I am particularly impressed by the leadership that the Instruct Eric organization and its members are providing in the arena of integrative or hybrid method structure determination. From my vantage point, this approach is the future of structural biology. High precision measurements of macromolecular machines combined with quantitative analytical tools will reveal the inner workings of a host of complex biological systems at the atomic level. Integrative or hybrid methods will also facilitate the work of our drug hunting colleagues as they pursue entirely new classes of drug discovery targets, seeking solutions that promote human health and fight disease. Since its inception, the Instruct organization has demonstrated an unfailing commitment to scientific excellence in the services it provides and the research it supports. I am proud to have played a small role in the success of Instruct and now Instruct Eric, and take much pleasure in celebrating its achievements, impact, and expanding ambitions with you. My name is Nicholas Paid, and I'm the Executive Director of the European Marine Biological Resource Center, EMBRC Eric. As a fellow life science research infrastructure, we've had the pleasure to work alongside Instruct for many years now. Our two infrastructures have always shared a joint desire to support fundamental research so we've been natural allies for a long time. We work together and Instruct on a number of Horizons 2020 projects. I've always thoroughly enjoyed working with Instruct as a partner. They're reliable, dependable, open to new ideas, and strive to develop innovative solutions. It is a pleasure for me to send our warm congratulations at this event, and we look forward to many more years of collaboration, cooperation, and friendship with Instruct Eric. So it's my pleasure to contribute to the celebration of the Instruct Eric, a sister organization. We have been working together in many projects funded by the European Commission, including the Corbel and the EOS Club project on data. But most importantly, the COVID crisis provides an opportunity to uh, 
to, to show the complementarity between these two infrastructure. During the first weeks and months of the COVID crisis, the structural biology community made a tremendous work to understand the protein structure of the virus. And now this protein structure is used by the biochemists to develop uh, small molecules, peptides, monoclonal antibodies, and vaccine to target the virus. And all these products have to be tested in multi-arm clinical trials, and this is what Equin is currently doing. So, so Instrux and Iatris have actually worked very closely uh, for, for many years now because we were both on the, the first roadmap. So we're really the founding, uh, some of the founding uh, members of the, of the S3 landscape. So we've worked uh, together a lot, not, in, not only in structuring our own communities, but then also in structuring the, 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 the ERIC landscape itself. Uh, for instance, through the ERIC Forum, in which we're founding members, uh, we work together a lot in sharing best practices with the rest of the community and helping to really shape the policy and operational environments so that current and future ERICs can, can learn and make the most of this network of organizations working together. And Instruct's always been a very close partner in that. It's a genuine pleasure to work with the Instruct team. It's a very committed team of, of very talented scientists and, and infrastructure managers. Susan is a, is a great leader whose, whose, whose passion for the field really comes through. Their professionalism and commitment is something that we really enjoy working with. Thank you very much for this opportunity for sending a video greeting on behalf of Eurobioimaging. From the very early days, Instruct and Eurobioimaging closely collaborate on many topics, ranging from common service provision in the COBOL project, outreach activities at large international scientific conferences, joint political work at the European level for raising awareness for life science research infrastructures. Congratulations, Instruct Eric, on your achievements and impact. We look forward to contributing to collaborate with you in the future. Those messages really uh, show the interaction between uh, Instruct and the other uh, biomedical science S3 projects and in fact with other other S3 projects throughout Europe. So um, I'm pleased to um, invite Roberta Zobi who's now con contacting us through a telephone. She's a deputy uh, head of uh, research and industrial infrastructures unit at the European Commission and will be speaking on a vision for research infrastructures in Europe. Please. Thank you very much. I'm really pleased to, to be here. And uh, indeed, I work in the research infrastructure unit. I'm relatively new in the unit uh, because I joined the unit only a year ago. So I'm still discovering uh, research infrastructures. Uh, and I'm really impressed by all the achievements that you, uh, you have been presenting. Um, in the unit, I'm in charge of uh, the ERIC team. So the um, procedures behind the setting up of ERIC, I see that the ERIC is a, is a, is a nice uh, uh, legal instrument for uh, enhancing cooperation between different organizations and research infrastructures. Uh, and I'm also in charge of the coordination of the preparation of the future work program. And today I would like to share with you where, where we stand with the preparation of the work program and uh, what's the process behind. Research infrastructure, the program is uh, included in the first pillar. Uh, I think you are familiar with, uh, with the structure of, uh, of the framework program and of Horizon Europe. The three pillars uh, complement each other. The first one is about excellence in science. The second one uh, uh, covers uh, uh, activities to address global challenges in in different areas, and the last one relates to in, uh, innovation uh, activities. In the proposal of the Commission, we have uh, indicated for research infrastructure a budget of 2.4 billion, and actually uh, with the agreement that was reached uh, only uh, towards the end of July by the heads of state, uh, the budget of Horizon Europe will be, will be reduced, and actually research infrastructure are also affected by the reduction. Actually, we do expect to um, uh, reach an amount of the order of two billion uh, for the next uh, seven years, uh, for the seven years of the um, Horizon uh, uh, Europe implementation. Uh, the European Parliament is very vocal in, in, in asking for more budget uh, for 
Horizon Europe and in particular uh, for Pillar 1. Uh, so we hope that uh, also the scientific community can mobilize to support these requests. Where we stand with the adoption of Horizon Europe, the, the framework program is not yet adopted. There are still uh, some issues under negotiation and in particular, of course, the budget because uh, uh, there was an agreement but formally speaking at interinstitutional level the budget is not yet adopted. Uh, there is the issue of synergies between different programs, uh, uh, which is still under discussion at the level of Council uh, and the Council uh, working party. Uh, and then uh, uh, there are uh, uh, discussions concerning the association of third countries. And finally, another open issue concerns the EIT, the European Institute. Uh, of innovation and technology. In preparing uh, uh, not only the proposal for, for Horizon Europe, but also and in particular war programs to implement uh, the framework program, uh, we have been and we are still uh, driven by the new priorities of Commission von der Leyen. Uh, you know that there are uh, six major priorities. Uh, Two of them uh, are becoming the heart of, uh, of, uh, of the framework program, in particular uh, research and innovation in support to the green and digital transition. Health has also become a key crucial priority at European level. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, the recovery plan and the priorities uh, that will be and which are already under discussion with the member states. So in our view, in preparing the work program, we consider that the research infrastructure uh, are more and more uh, important uh, and are becoming really strategic investments uh, to support uh, the policy priority and the uh, societal challenges uh, uh, that we have ahead. Uh, therefore, in the work program, the work program reflects this policy priority and uh, uh, it will be structured uh, with new terminology and, and, and new type of activities I'm going to end to you uh, in the next, uh, in the, with the next slides. The first work program is expected to be adopted early in 2021, provided, of course, that uh, the uh, overall budget for the next seven years is adopted. As I said, there is a new terminology, uh, destinations. Is, uh, uh, destination is the word that replaces uh, somehow what we called in the, in the past uh, calls. So destination will group together different topics that will be implemented through calls. Destination one, uh, the research infrastructure ecosystem, the uh, research infrastructure uh, landscape and all the activities uh, which underpin a well-functioning uh, research infrastructure landscape. Mo many of them are linked to uh, the activities which are implemented with and by ESFRI and with the member states. Uh, there is a topic that we, I would like to highlight uh, that uh, we expect uh, uh, to launch in, uh, in, in the first uh, work program cycle, so already in 2021, about uh, the experiences and the lessons uh, learned by research infrastructures during uh, the lockdown, uh, because uh, many of them uh, reorganized uh, the working modality and continued uh, to provide research infrastructure services to the research community, not only in the area of health and biomedical research, but also other research infrastructure where uh, showed high uh, levels of, of resilience from this point of view. We think that, that there is something that can be learned, that can become a good practice. So we would like to have a topic to really see which are the, the needs and, and, uh, and the lessons then that can be drawn from that experience. So Destination 2 is about uh, the implementation of the uh, European Open Science Cloud ecosystem. Uh, many topics will address, uh, uh, will also include uh, 
use cases in, in very specific thematic areas. This uh, destination will be implemented through call for proposals, but in a a slightly different way compared to the other destination because EOSC uh, will be uh, implemented through a co-funded partnership together with major stakeholders and the member states as well. And actually now uh, the strategic agenda uh, with the research priority of EOSC is under discussion and, and in preparation. So uh, future priorities will uh, come up uh, through uh, a wide uh, consultation and co-creation process uh, that will involve uh, key stakeholders in the uh, development and implementation of the uh, EOSC uh, uh, ecosystem. The next destination, so number three, is about the research infrastructure services. This is not something new because already in Horizon 2020 that was you know, one of the uh, uh, main activities for, of the program, but actually uh, there is a shift uh, in how priorities are identified. Uh, this destination will consist of two, let's say, families of priorities, one addressing uh, key uh, policy priorities, in particular to support uh, health research, uh, but also to support the transition uh, towards a green and digital society and economy. And then the second family will be uh, more in, uh, in areas uh, um, addressing uh, uh, fundamental sciences. Concerning the challenge-driven provision of research uh, infrastructure services, we are identifying uh, some priorities. For sure, there will be topic addressing diseases. We are thinking to have a topic uh, uh, that uh, uh, will be conceived to complement the activities that are implemented in the context of the mission on cancer. You know that Horizon Europe has already identified five main missions uh, uh, which uh, will bring together activities beyond research and innovation, but uh, to make sure that uh, the impact uh, is, uh, uh, is really uh, is something very concrete. Then we are envisaging uh, uh, a topic uh, to support uh, climate change and in particular to address mitigation and ad adaptation uh, capacity to react to, to, to climate change. We are thinking uh, uh, to a topic in the area of uh, uh, materials uh, uh, and in particular uh, research uh, services uh, uh, to support new materials, innovative materials, sustainable materials for a circular economy. And we would like to have something uh, to support agricultural research. Many of these topics uh, will uh, ask, will call a research infrastructure to uh, integrate uh, different types of services. Uh, to also uh, undertake activities to better customize their services in relation to specific needs, uh, and also to uh, integrate uh, other disciplines uh, to be able to provide a wide portfolio of services. And as I said, there is also the possible topics uh, to uh, provide services to address uh, frontier research and, uh, and basic research, and uh, in order to define the priorities, we are now developing a multi-annual planning to see uh, which are uh, the scientific domains uh, that we want to address in the first two years of, of Horizon Europe. And of course, we will take into consideration in developing this multi-annual planning the ongoing activities, uh, the emerging priorities, uh, so we are in the process of, of developing the multi-annual planning. Destination number four, the focus is uh, on the development uh, of uh, research infrastructure technologies. So new scientific instrumentations, tools and methods, but also uh, digital solutions. And here uh, we aim at supporting uh, the uh, technological excellence of, uh, of uh, European research infrastructure. So destination three and destination four, if uh, you compare these activities with Horizon 2020, uh, 
uh, we have split uh, the activities that were covered in Horizon 2020 under the integrating activities, where both provision of services and joint uh, research uh, were, uh, were um, covered. We consider that it is important to have a clear focus on research infrastructure service in one destination and then to invest in the technological development in destination four. And finally, destination five is about the physical infrastructure as uh, the enabler of, uh, of a collaboration without uh, boundaries uh, in science. Uh, Jean uh, will bring forward a number of activities which, are, which have already been implemented uh, in Horizon 2020, including uh, high-performing computing and also, uh, and also the international, uh, international networks. This is what I intended to present to you. Hope to be able to stay for uh, questions and for further discussion. Thank you. Roberta, thank you very much. It's clear in some of the directions that the EC is going. Let me just introduce, this is David Stewart. He's the director of Instruct Eric. He was the founding director and he's the current director. And a, a lot of Instruct depends directly on David. David, please. Uh, thanks ever so much, Joel. That, that's that, that's uh, lovely. Uh, it's uh, humbling to, to have the, all, all those sort of lovely words at the beginning. Um, I, I, I'm not a full-time uh, director, and as you've gathered, uh, the people in, in the hub in Oxford and the people in the centres do uh, nearly all the work of Instruct, so it's a pleasure to have been associated with it. The first question is why Instruct? As Joel has said, it's integrated structural biology, and this goes, it goes back uh, many years now, where to the point at which a, a number of uh, scientists in Europe uh, had a vision of, of increasing the power and reach of structural biology by providing uh, high-end infrastructure, cutting-edge infrastructure. And the ultimate aim was uh, intended to be to give an integrated view of life um, from uh, the structural perspective in molecular detail and uh, ideally in four dimensions. So this, the, the idea was to really sort of try and integrate structural and cell biology and transform uh, our view of, of, uh, of life with obviously the expectation that that would have impact on biomedical applications as well. And that it was science fiction, of course, at that point, but but it's been for the last sort of 20 years, there have been repeated technical advances that have driven the science uh, forward. So we, we were sort of carried away with this and, and uh, uh, really sort of uh, thought that something interesting could be done. And this was best captured by Dina Morass, one of the, the founders of, uh, of all of this. Uh, at a meeting back in 2005 in Montecatini, and this was quoted by Joel in when he did a roadmap for the future of structural biology in 2005. And Dino captured this as the idea of watching molecules dancing in the cell, doing their their job in the cell. So this has been the sort of background uh, vision, and it goes back a long way, uh, essentially about 20 years now, to a series of framework uh, program grants. Uh, that built con the, a consortium um, and then developed into uh, the idea of a, of a genuine pan-European infrastructure. And I just wanted to acknowledge the, the, the people that were involved in the, this original conception. I've mentioned Dino, but Ivano Bertini uh, and Lucia Banchi in Florence, uh, Joel and Stephen Cusack uh, were, were, pro were, were the real sort of key uh, people that, that kicked this off. Um, and it, it took some years to, uh, with support from, from the uh, EU and the EC to, to get this uh, moving. But uh, by early uh, 2000, by 2011, we were starting to deliver services to users. Um, so this is a distributed infrastructure that provides um, access to technology for structural biology users. And by 2016, Instruct was recognized as a landmark project on the S3 roadmap. 
And then in 2017, uh, Instruct was awarded the status of European Research Infrastructure Consortium. So we became an ERIC. And, uh, uh, you can, and this was a bit sobering for what had begun as a bottom-up uh, operation. This now had really grown up into a, into a major uh, in, international uh, infrastructure uh, that was had to be run in a professional way. And uh, the people in the hub have, have really uh, risen to this and uh, I think done a good job of doing that. And we've, uh, as you've heard from, from Eric, uh, we've got a very good council to keep us in, in line and uh, make sure we do uh, stick to these high standards. So that, those pictures are from the uh, ceremony in the Royal Society when uh, uh, the uh, Eric status was awarded. So the current situation is that we've now got 15 uh, countries slash international organizations. This has been, it continues to, membership continues to grow. The individual member countries pay a, uh, a relatively modest subscription that uh, then enables them to get access to the uh, technology, uh, to internships, research and development projects and, and training. Um, and the one of the very recent uh, members, we, we Finland joined very recently, but uh, it's really great to see EMBL join as a major international organization and one of the uh, big players in the area of uh, molecular and structural biology in, in Europe. So this is, uh, uh, and they, they were involved from the beginning. So this is a, a, a great thing to see. I've mentioned the, the Instruct Hub, and I just wanted to, to put this up because there's a, a whole cohort of people that uh, make this distributed infrastructure run. Um, although the, uh, the actual technology is delivered in, in centers around Europe, all of the um, access is organized through an online application system and uh, there, there's a tremendous amount of administration work that the guys in, in the hub have to do. So we're really lucky to have a, 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 a very dedicated team to make this work. And but the delivery, as I say, is done in these instruct centers, distributed around, and the latest coming online is uh, the EMBL center. We're just um, uh, finalizing the service level agreement with EMBL. So this, this, is, uh, this will be a another major step up in our provision uh, when, when they come online. And as I've already hinted, the idea is to give access in a democratic way to scientists in all of the member countries to techno cutting edge technology that they otherwise would struggle to get access to. Not only that, to give people expert guidance and you know, in, in extremists, uh, we, 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 are, we hope to be able to respond relatively rapidly to things. Um, and that I, I think we can see in what happened with the response to COVID-19, which I'll say a few words about in a, in a moment. But um, in terms of the technology, I won't go th into great details about this. I think Lucia will, will hopefully mention a, a real landmark, which is the uh, a significant advance in uh, uh, magnetic resonance uh, technology um, that's come online in, in Florence very recently. Um, but so that she will come back to, but I'd just like to make one point that alongside the development of Instruct, I've mentioned that technology has developed very rapidly. And in the last six years or so, that's been particularly true of electron microscopy, where there's been uh, now a couple of uh, sort of rounds of, of, of a revolution increase in the impact. And uh, th this is a very expensive technology. So uh, the, a few of us uh, published a little article trying to make the case for democratizing access to cryo-EM uh, in Nature Methods a few years ago. And I think Instruct is, uh, is really a good example of, of uh, doing that, opening up this to very broadly to, to people with interesting problems. And this is the very high end uh, capability of just a single instruct center now, which is many millions of pounds worth of, uh, of equipment and e an even larger number of uh, millions of euros of, of equipment, but not only the equipment with the expert support to, to help people. And in fact, if you look at the moment, uh, there's already, and this will increase, is about to increase nine instruct centers offering cryo-EM, cryo-electron tomography, uh, 
the machining of, uh, of uh, mammalian cells, software support, etc. And the principle is that this, is the, this technology is free at the point of use. People can apply any time and we try and have rapid peer review. So the criteria for access is just scientific excellence. So, and in terms of the sort of scale of this, you can see from this sort of tagline at the bottom, which is on our website, at the moment there's uh, almost a thousand publications attributable to, to Instruct and our sort of user base in terms of people that are signed up is over, over 10,000. So this is a significant uh, activity. In addition to, to the um, provision of, of the services, the other thing is to, to try and have focused training courses to make sure people are able to make the most of this cutting edge technology. And this, this uh, obviously has been affected dramatically by the uh, pandemic, uh, but uh, it's a, a really important thing. And moving to, uh, to more uh, virtual sort of training is, is something that we're working very actively on in, in Instruct. In addition, what's worked very well is having internships, which are longer periods for very focused training in, in, in particularly important techniques uh, where people come to work at an instruct center. There's been some really successful uh, examples of that. Um, and uh, research and development, little uh, seed grants that enable people to, to explore an idea and then go forward and get a bigger grant. And that, there's good examples where where that has led to some significant funding being obtained. Instruct is also very much a partner in a large number of European grants. Um, uh, because we're an ERIC, we can be a, a partner in, in such grants. And I just want to mention a couple of things. I mean, for, for the future, um, structural biology generates a lot of data. And I think one of the important challenges for the next few years is going to be uh, the engagement and uh, definition development of, of the European Open Science Cloud. So we're very, very committed to uh, being involved in, in that. Um, and uh, one relatively small grant that, uh, that Instruct coordinates is the RIVIS, which is to expand the visibility of the European research infrastructures, which I think is, is, is really important. And related to that, I think one of the uh, current challenges now that people are thinking about very hard is in the context of Horizon Europe, can we better integrate scientific research infrastructures with the researchers, with, with the users? Are there ways that we can get better value out of the research infrastructures? I will just mention COVID-19 because it's been such a sort of uh, disruptive thing for everything, but it, it's an example of, of, of how science can respond at an international level. The sequence of the, 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 the virus, um, SARS-CoV-2, was only published, I think, at the beginning of February. So the, we were contacted by researchers in China who uh, at that point were struggling to get access to uh, facilities. And uh, we talked to them and we, we started in collaboration with them and cloned and produced the protease. I say we. This is driven by research groups in the UK and in Israel, the Weizmann, uh, Martin Walsh, Frank von Delft and Neil London. One of the key potential drug targets was uh, produced very quickly. And uh, before the end of February, not only was the atomic resolution structure determined, it, it, it was determined even earlier in, in China, but this was a really high resolution structure done uh, by the groups uh, associated with Instruct. Uh, but not only that, but by linking very closely with Near London in the, uh, in the, in the Israeli uh, Instruct Center at the Weizmann, um, it was possible to screen a large number of compounds and actually validate by doing high resolution three-dimensional structures that these, uh, these bound. So the, Tremendous development in technology, uh, coupled with this international collaboration, meant that it was possible by mid-March to, uh, to have a database of a large number of uh, fra chemical fragments bound 
in the active site and elsewhere of the main protease. And the majority of these were actually uh, covalent in inhibitors generated from the, um, uh, the activity of near London at the Weizmann. This really then triggered a, a bigger international activity, which uh, became the Moonshot program. Uh, and John Cadero in the US was uh, really one of the person that sort of helped uh, get this take off. And uh, I, I, this is a little bit out of date now, it's, uh, but it's certainly by late August, um, there, by opening this up into, to, publicly, it was possible to engage medicinal chemists who would otherwise be twiddling their thumbs in some of the, uh, uh, some of the companies to come up with potential drug designs based on the structure, the initial structures to come up with better compounds. Some of the chemical synthesis companies bought into this and really uh, threw their weight behind it. And already very, in very short order, uh, a number of nanomolar affinity compounds have, have been generated and structures determined validating the binding. So this is just to, to give an idea of this, what has now become a, a global uh, effort. And I think it's really encouraging the way that uh, companies like Enamine in the Ukraine have uh, essentially pro bono uh, put effort into to helping make compounds to accelerate this. And uh, you've heard from uh, Stephen Burley uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, Stephen, uh, I, I think, made the point early in the, in the pandemic that this really should not have been a complete surprise to the world. You know, we, we'd had SARS and MERS um, or previously, and there'd been efforts to start drug discovery against those viruses. So clearly one of the challenges, global challenges for the world is not to just let this stop as a proof of principle, but to take this through now, through neutralization studies, through animal studies, to human trials and to make sure that we push on and get validated drugs that uh, can make a difference. I think there's a huge need for potent antivirals at the moment. Um, so as Stephen observed, this was an example of market failure that we had nothing when this pandemic came. And just to, to a slightly different tack, one of the great triumphs of, of Instruct in my view is the work that Jan Steyert has done, setting up the uh, Nanobodies for Instruct Center um, in Belgium. Uh, he's really sort of kicked off a, a lot of very important applications of nanobodies, which are little mini versions of antibodies. And I'll just, just this just shows a sort of spin off of this, which is a nanobody, uh, which is uh, shown here in yellow, attached and neutralizing the spike of SARS. Uh, COV2. And this is spin out work that uh, happened in the UK. So I think this is, uh, this is just to say that structural biology not only is, is contributing to the development of small molecule therapeutics, but also to biological therapeutics like antibodies and potentially nanobodies, and really has a role to play also in structure based vaccinology. Um, so there's real applications of this. And just to, to say, just to go back to the original vision of looking at molecules dancing in the cell of Dino uh, in 2005, um, there's a paper that just came out a, a few days ago from our group, but we, which gives an example of, of how we're beginning to get to move in that direction. And this is where we took uh, some mammalian cells, put them on a cryo-EM grid, grew the cells for a while, infected them with the virus, and then used a machine called a focused iron uh, beam milling machine to cut away the cell to reveal a very thin sliver of cell, which we could then look at in the, with a uh, high power electron microscope and see the virus. So this is 12 hours after the virus was put on the outside of the cell, it has replicated and there is a lot of virus inside the cell. And the development of the methods over the, over the years since 2005 means that it's now possible using this technology to see, uh, this is a reconstruction, three-dimensional reconstruction based on that data um, on the previous slide of 
an assembly intermediate of a virus infecting the cell. So it's now possible to capture short-lived intermediate states of things like viruses inside cells. They're frozen, they're, they're, they're not dancing, it's a snapshot of, a, of this, but it's a, a, a real indication of the direction of travel of structured biology. So to wrap up, the future, the, the challenge is to maintain the scientific excellence. There's new user communities to engage. And as the reach of the methods in, increases, the, the challenge is to engage with cell biologists and broader communities. Uh, and to make sure we keep on uh, at the cutting edge of, of technology development. And uh, again, Lucia can come back to, to address that. I'll now hand back to Joel to carry on with the, uh, uh, the, the rest of the programme. So thank you very much. It's, it's been a, a fantastic uh, thing to be associated with Instruct. Thank you. David, David, thank you very, very much. I think you gave an excellent overview of Instruct. And in parallel, you showed how Instruct starts with basic research. And some of the basic research can lead almost directly to translational medicinal chemistry which was uh, seen so clearly in the COVID-19 uh, COVID case. Okay, we, we will now um, have Stephen Kozik, Kuzak, who um, is um, the head of the EMBL Grenoble Outstation and was one of the founders of, of Instruct, as uh, David mentioned. Stephen, please. Well, it's a great pleasure to be back in the, um, in the family of those who uh, are in Instruct. Eric, EMBL, as, as you heard, was involved at the beginning, but but now we've recently rejoined as a, um, a full member of the Instruct ERIC. And my job today is to talk a little bit about those, mem those uh, member states like us who have recently joined. So you will know that in 2017, Instruct ERIC began with 11 founding members. And uh, in the last couple of years, um, there have been others that have joined, Latvia, Finland and Lithuania are recently welcomed as new member countries. And just in passing, I point out that Latvia has also just joined EMBL as a prospect member. Uh, last year, EMBL joined as Instruct's first intergovernmental organization. And I'll, most of my, what I'll talk about is, is why, why we did this. Um, we now have across the uh, 20, uh, across the members, 11 instruct centers that offer access to 23 research sites across Europe. And uh, a bit preemptively, I have marked in this picture the EMBL sites, although as you've heard, we're, we're not, um, we're still negotiating the, the service level agreement. So amongst the new sites as member states is Finland. Um, and uh, there are three um, universities in the Instruct Center of Finland, the University of Helsinki, of Ulu, and of Eastern Finland. And this, these together, they provide a wide uh, range of technologies and expertise in, in all aspects of integrated structural biology. There's been a new facility that's joined the Instruct Center of Belgium. This is called Robotine. Um, it's, it's partly at universities of Liège and Brussels. And uh, it has high expertise in high throughput protein production and characterization of samples. And finally, um, the Asprey Center in Leeds has joined Instruct Center UK. And they offer in particular uh, high level cryo-EM mass spectrometry and NMR at the University of Leeds. So I'm going to talk a bit more about EMBL. As you know, EMBL is what we like to say Europe's flagship molecular biology institute, which now has 27 full members and a couple of prospect members, as I mentioned, Latvia and Lithuania. And um, we're distributed on six sites and now number up to 1,800 people. The key thing about EMBL is its missions. And what I want to point out here is essential overlap with the missions of Instruct. And this covers uh, provision of scientific services, provision of advanced training, workshops, 
uh, students, postdocs, workshops, and most recently MBL is starting up a program in, in training of uh, facility managers, which I think is very important for resource infrastructures. Then innovation and translation and integration within Europe of life science activities. So essentially all our missions map onto and, and uh, those of Instruct. So it's only natural we were involved at the beginning and it's natural we're now back in and wanting to work forward. But as, as has been said already, everything starts with research and EMBL's vision is very broad and it's, it's, it's uh, going to get even broader, we hope, in the next scientific program, all the way from molecules to ecosystems, that is how molecules really work in, the, uh, in, the, in situ in the environment. And um, this is what we think is really necessary to be able to tackle the grand challenges in health and the environment. But to have that great research vision, you also need the technologies and the infrastructures. And here again, we have a broad vision of crossing scales in biology from studying molecules through machines, seeing them dance in the cells, we hope, and even in the organisms. Correspondingly, you need the infrastructures to do this. You need the data integration, you need the theory, you need the technology development, and all this is part and parcel of what EMBL is all about, but also what Instruct is all about. Finally, we need to integrate life science research and life science into infrastructures within Europe. And the MBL does this at many levels. We have a lot of local and regional partnerships, but more to the point of today's uh, discussion, we, we've been involved for 25 years in EU structural biology networks, integrated projects and I3s. And some of them are listed here. And David mentioned these at the beginning were um, spine and spine two complexes. These were really the forerunner of Instruct. We were heavily involved in the Instruct preparative phase and, uh, but our interest in S3 projects is, is not limited to Instruct. In fact, we have been the founders and coordinators of Eurobioimaging and Elixir. So EMBL scientific service, the principles and usage, we, we, we have principles that again align with Instruct, accessible infrastructures, in-house technology development, expertise, quality, and we have a, a very strong record of service in provision in all areas of um, structural biology up and up to uh, cell biology and, and, and bioinformatics. More specifically in structural biology, we have three, four sites, three of them doing experimental work and service precision. I'll come back to these in a minute, but then I, I, although I won't say much, of course, we also have the EBI and its protein data bank and, and knowledge database. So in Hamburg, they of course work closely with the uh, DAISY synchrotron and with the current PETRA-3. Uh, they provide services in heme lines, BioSACs, MX, and also they have an SPC facility for sample preparation and characterization. And within Instruct, Essentially, these, all these facilities will be offered. In Heidelberg, the principal access offered will be to CryoEM. Um, there's substantial uh, equipment in microscopes. European access is already being granted through other programs like INEXT and INEXT Discovery. And this will continue with Instruct. And this is... Um, uh, a feature of this is the, the brand new imaging center in Heidelberg. Interestingly, this is at the interface between Instruct and Neurobioimaging. Part of this idea of crossing scales and providing integrated access to infrastructures, whether you want to look at molecules by cryoEM or cells and uh, tissue and organisms by various um, light microscopies. So this um, imaging center should be finished by the end of this year. And it's hoped that services will begin, for instance, in electron microscopy, microscopy in summer next year. Finally, in Grenoble, 
we work closely on one level with the with the ESRF, the European Synchrotron, but also with our other campus partners within the Partnership for Structural Biology. And uh, again, have been providing services for many, many years. Um, what we will be doing in Instruct is mainly proposing our high through crystallization services, which are provide highly automated pipelines into fragment screening or structure determination, um, which you can manipulate these pipelines directly using uh, on, on web-based servers. So I'd like to finish with two slides. One is this to say a real thank you to Florence Cipriani, a long-term colleague of mine at the MBL Grenoble and and principal driver of all these different uh, innovations that you see highlighted. He's really been an amazing engineer that has served the community for structural biology, particularly in diffraction instrumentation and uh, European developing European standards like the spine and, and more recent mini spine. So I really want to take this opportunity to thank him on his retirement, which is about to happen. And the, the second final slide is a bit more future looking. These are three of the frontier technologies that I think uh, EMBL is obviously interested in, but not only, and Instruct certainly as well. And I hope we can work together in developing these frontier technologies from prototypes, real experimental setups into full user services. And here I'm talking about um, new methods in, in uh, time-resolved crystallography, which are particularly going to become um, more easy with the fourth generation synchrotron sources like just being started up again in the SRF. As David said, this dancing in the cell, this is for me the, perhaps the most exciting future direction for um, uh, structural biology. But then there's also X-ray imaging, which fills in certain gaps in the um, crossing of scales and is particularly interesting in, in neurobiology at the level of, of neuron organization, but also at the subcellular level. So with that, I want to thank all those who've helped me put together this presentation and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Stephen, very much for your presentation. I'm, and on behalf of Instruction, everyone in, who's participating in this meeting, I want to thank you for all your efforts to bring EMBL back into Instruct, it's clear it's going to make an enormous difference for Instruct and for, and for European research. The last part was just fascinating, your, your, your future view of where things are going and that we may be able to finally do what Dino, Dino envisioned, to see molecules dancing in the cell. So Andy Smith will make a short presentation on opportunities to collaborate in open access data sharing. Andrew, please. Okay, thank you, Joel. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'd just like to start by thanking Dave and Susan and the, the rest of the Instruct team for the invitation to, to speak to you today. Um, it's been a really nice event so far, so, so thank you for that. What I'd like to do in this um, short presentation is just to give you my own perspective on some of the opportunities um, that are open to the Instruct community to collaborate on open access and data sharing. Um, some of these are through projects that Instruct is already involved in, like EOSC Life, but I'll also present some um, future opportunities through the European Open Science Cloud and look at some of the policy drivers as well that could continue to enable um, collaboration and open access and data sharing. And then also I'll finish with one or two examples of really nice collaboration that takes place in the moment, um, looking at COVID-19 as a, as a use case actually, so that it's quite topical. So um, if you don't know what the EOSC Life project is, let me just introduce it very briefly to you. It's a project um, which brings together all of the 13 life science research infrastructures, um, including Instruct. Um, and it built, as Dave mentioned in his, in his first presentation as well, it builds on collaboration that has taken place previously between these research infrastructures through the Corbell project. And the aim of EOSC Life is to try and help to create the life science component of the European Open Science Cloud. So all of the 13 S3 research infrastructures in the life science domain are involved in the project. 
And as a whole, the project has over has 47 partners. Um, and it's just had a, a, it's just getting a, a grant um, agreement extension to do some COVID-19 related work, which I mentioned in a moment as well. And the aim of the project is really about trying to um, publish fair life science data um, and, the, and, and resources around that into the European Open Science Cloud and to try and build on the ecosystem of tools developers or so software tools developers that exist around the, the current life science research infrastructures and ultimately make it easier for researchers to be able to compute on those data. So getting access to compute resources and using those tools that have been developed. So that's really the purpose of the EOSC Life project. You can see here that actually Europe um, is very diverse um, and that's one of its strengths. So there are a large number of different facilities, technologies, national research infrastructures that are spread across Europe and they bring together many different research infrastructures, which you can see in the middle, covering many different types of technologies, different data types and application areas as well. And so the, the concept of EOSC Life is really about trying to connect those distributed research infrastructures um, and try to encourage the, um, the publication um, of those data into the FAIR ecosystem of the European Open Science Cloud. And at the same time, to develop new tools and cloud opportunities for researchers to be able to compute on those data as well. So that, that's, in, in essence, that's the, the scope of the project. Now, immediately, um, the, one of the first opportunities, as well as Instruct being a partner in that project, which will help it to hopefully do, to um, support its, its user communities, there's a current call within EOSC Life that is open at the moment. In fact, I believe it opened yesterday, and it's really about trying to provide access to support to help to make data fair through data management experts and tools developers as well, and allowing researchers to get access to those compute facilities that I mentioned. So I think this is one thing where it, I, I can already imagine that the Instruct community is thinking about how to respond to this call or the particular research projects where you would benefit from, from the opportunities that are afforded through this digital life sciences open call. So I think that's, that's an immediate opportunity for collaboration in open data and data sharing. And the deadline for that is the 22nd of December. And the, co the, the link to get, further to get further details and to submit applications if the community is interested is via the bottom of, um, the bottom of this slide. So that gives you some immediate opportunities where the Instruct community could, um, could be able to get some support to be able to, to develop those ideas. But if we also look at the future, and Roberta was, was given a presentation about the structure of Horizon Europe. Well, what I want to do here is maybe touch on some of that, but bring out a little bit of the, the broader policy drivers that could help to shape what Horizon Europe looks like as we transition from Horizon 2020 to Horizon Europe. Now, for a number of years, open science and data management have been highly topical um, um, political priorities. It's led to data management plans being enforced through the European Commission and so on. And, and that's a good thing. And I think those themes of open science and data management will continue to be a high priority in Horizon Europe, mainly through the European Open Science Cloud, but not only that as well. Each infrastructure individually also generates data. And so it, it's an important theme for each infrastructure to think of themselves, not just on collaborative projects through the European Open Science Cloud. But if we look at some of the high level drivers that are new in which we might expect will influence the agenda in future, if we look at the new European data strategy, and I've included a link in the slide if anyone's interested. So here, for example, a, pub a publication was, was um, put for communication for consultation earlier in the year. It's really a large part of it is about trying to keep Europe competitive as well. Um, it's not just about research data, it's about all forms of data from e-government through to company data as well. Um, and it's possible that legislation will be introduced in future. And so the, the theme of creating an environment in Europe where data can be shared freely is really high on the agenda. And so we can see that being the driver behind new developments as well, including the concept, for example, of European health data spaces. 
So trying to link together research data from some of the infrastructures that we're involved in with other types of data, it could be clinical data, patient data, it could be geospatial data, for example. So I think that will be a theme that emerges in future, trying to connect research data with other data types as well. And there's also a concept of high value data sets so I think the, the, the communities that are active in Struct are already aware of, of, of you know, the, the importance and the, the, the benefits of having shared structural bioinformatics data for a long, long time. But there are other communities in different disciplines where um, they're only just beginning to understand the value of data sets. And so there's a push to try and recognize these high value data sets much more as well. One of the other things I wanted to mention is to, to keep this topical as well is the, the European response from the Commission and member states to the coronavirus. So the Commission itself earlier in the year published the ERA versus Corona Action Plan. And it's really nice to see that one of the foundations of that is about prioritizing access to research infrastructures. So if you look at that action plan, action eight is really about helping or encouraging research in infrastructures to mobilize access. So it was really nice when Dave earlier was talking about the moonshot that instructors opened and the opportunities that have been available for researchers to be able to do COVID-19 related research um, and SARS-CoV-2 related research through the instruct facilities. And that's a really, really nice example. And then, of course, action nine of that is about trying to develop the European COVID-19 data portal. And that's something that I'll mention in a moment, because there there's other opportunities to ensure that the COVID-19 data portal contains data from, from many different research um, infrastructures as well. So they were some of the, the policy drivers that I think we can expect to shape the landscape in Horizon Europe. If we come back to the European Open Science Cloud in future, so right now, um, we're involved in the EOSC Life Project, 13 life science research infrastructures. And what will happen in Horizon Europe, um, there will be a new funding scheme called a partnership, which will bring together the calls for proposals around the European Open Science Cloud, but will help to bring them more closely together with member states as well. And I think that would be one of the new things that we can expect in Horizon Europe and need to prepare ourselves for. So right now, most of the EOSC related calls have been opened through the Research Infrastructures Programme. But if we look in the future, we can expect member states themselves to try and get more involved. That could be through a greater adoption of open science and data management policies as well. Or it could be, for example, making uh, or pooling investments through cash or in-kind contributions as well. So that EOSC isn't just a series of EU projects, but it actually includes hard contributions from member states as well. So that's something that's on the agenda and we need to be, to, to be um, ready to take the opportunities through that as well. If you're interested in finding out what's being talked about in the context of the European Open Science Cloud Partnership, you can see the Strategic Research and Innovation Agenda. That's the second link in, the, um, in this slide. And here there's been a recent consultation. And I think it's nice to see how um, the European Open Science Cloud is moving from connecting existing projects to also looking to try and address some of the systemic bottlenecks that could hinder open science. So for example, there's a section about needing to address some of the rewards and recognition that stop researchers sharing data as well. And there's also a section about possible certification of registries as well. So they are things that we can expect to, um, to, to be happening um, in the European Open Science Cloud Partnership in Horizon Europe. And then one of the other things you may be aware, there's currently an expression of interest open for research infrastructures or funders or universities to actually become a member of the legal entity that is behind the European Open Science Cloud, so the EOSC Association. And that's something that I know many S3 research infrastructures are considering at the moment, whether they should actually become a formal member of the, of the um, association that sits behind the European Open Science Cloud. I mentioned earlier when I explained the ERA versus Corona Action Plan, how one part of this is about providing access to research infrastructures. And another part of it is about enabling the sharing of, uh, of infectious disease related data. And in the context of the EOSC Live project, it's been really great to see how um, both of those things have been happening. So the European Data Portal is a new, a new resource 
that brings together national data hubs and also a central COVID-19 portal, which is run by Emble EBI. And here, there are many different data, data types and types of data sets that are being made available through the COVID-19 portal, um, including structural data as well through, through Instruct facilities, but it also includes sequence data. There are tools for people to use. There's literature that has references to COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2 as well, as well as compounds. And that's really what the emergency response of the EOSC Life project has been to try and help to mobilize and increase the data flow from existing research infrastructures into the COVID-19 data portal, as well as building channels to allow national research infrastructures that might not be connected to the current infrastructures to be able to put um, data into the national data hubs as well. So it's been a really nice response to see in action how research infrastructures such as Instruct can collaborate on, on topics like infectious diseases. One of the other areas I think it's worth mentioning is the fact that over the previous few years, all research infrastructures have, have been developing their own systems to provide access to um, um, the technologies and the facilities of those research infrastructures. And in the EOSC Life project, there's a lot of work being done to try and streamline some of these access technologies and Instruct is heavily involved in doing this. So for example, if you were to submit a proposal to the current EOSC Life open call, then it's actually the Instruct ARIA system, which researchers would use to be able to submit that application. BBMRI has a similar one called the Negotiator. Elixir has a similar one called AAI. And there's a lot of work being done in this project to help to, to see where connections can be made so that there is a life science login system to make it easier for researchers. And that's another nice example of how this collaboration can take place. And I just wanted to finish by giving an example of how tools and resources can be developed jointly, even outside of EU projects. Um, by research groups involved in research infrastructures like Instruct and Elixir. So if you take a resource like 3D BioNotes, which is a, a, which many of you will be aware is a, is a resource that, that relates to, to structural bioinformatics. Now here, they've re they've, um, partners in Elixir Spain and Instruct have, have rapidly developed a COVID-19 tool that allows for better analysis and exploitation of the data that sit into 3D BioNotes. So I wanted to include it as a topical example of how the, the communities within these research infrastructures can really work quickly to mobilize uh, and improve existing resources to make it easier to, to, to try and address the, the current pandemic. And that's where I wanted to finish. Um, so hopefully that's given you a good opportunity of some of, the, um, some of the ways in which collaboration can take place in open access and data sharing. Andrew, thank you very much for this presentation. I think you really have shown clearly that in to data sharing and access that life sciences really has become a, a digital science, not just a qualitative science. So we have now time for a few uh, questions and answers. We have two questions already. Let me read the first one from, this one was from Alberto Portone in Strasbourg. The COVID effort described by Professor Dave Stewart is an example of a common effort that accelerates science enormously. How could Instruct extend this type of efforts? Dave, maybe you could address this, please. Well, I think this is a, I, I think that's, a, that's an interesting question. And it's, uh, it's something that uh, we, we, uh, we've considered uh, uh, you know, we discussed within Instruct o o over the years whether there there are ways that uh, that, that we can have a more of a sort of focused uh, uh, common effort on particular scientific uh, uh, questions. Um, and I think the uh, it, it's been it's been tricky because we've want, not wanted to. Uh, narrow down the, the scope of the infrastructure to particular things but uh, uh, but but maybe th this is something where there's a there's a discussion to be had with the with the EU um, to see uh, how, how, how this, this this could be done to get better uh, sort of joined up 
activity in this area. I, I think it, it, it's clear that if there's a real will to make this happen, it can be very effective, as Alberto says. I, I agree. I mean, it was really quite extraordinary how quickly Instruct uh, moved and played such a crucial role in, in, in the early stages of the COVID outbreak. Right. So uh, we have a second question from uh, Portugal, fr from uh, Maria Arminia Curando. This is for Stephen Kuzak. How will EMBL take and consider Instruct users in relation with the usual operation of EMBL? meaning services provided within the mode of operation, activities and guidelines of Instruct. Stephen. I, I really don't see a major problem here. I mean, we are in discussion with Instruct actually over this service level agreement. I, I don't want to go into details there. I don't think there are any, any game blockers. Um, the fact is that EMBL services are open to EMBL member states and through this instruct operation they'll be open to instruct users. So I, I really don't see the problem here. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Great. I'm also, I'm, I don't think there's any problem either. There's a question from Jose Maria Carrasso Garcia for David again on, on helping in our understanding of COVID. Could you comment on, on how Instruct has contributed to our understanding of COVID-2 fundamental biology and the way it interacts with cells? Instruct is, 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 not, uh, is not alone. The, the, the effort on COVID-19 has, has been so genuinely international. Um, you know, Instruct and, uh, and Europe play, play one part in it. Um, but and I think the, the the interaction with the cells is still there. There's still a lot of basic biology that we don't understand. We, you know, people know that the spike interacts with the ACE2 uh, receptor on the on the cell surface, and we know the principle of of, of how the, um, the, the the fusion protein undergoes a conformational change. But I think there's there's still a lot uh, and a lot of un still unpublished work some of it on 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 what modulates the stability and in fact uh, uh, again there's been a very a very nice collaboration between Oxford and the Weizmann for instance in trying to uh, see how we can modulate the stability of the spike which which might throw some light on that and I know that uh, uh, again there's unpublished work showing uh, the <coughs> showing what happened showing how uh, the, the virus interacts with cells. But of course, looking at the cellular context here is, is more difficult because of the disease security uh, side and the, um, uh, the, the risk of, of working with in, infectious virus particles. So, uh, so I, think, I, I think it'll take a little bit longer before we get to that. And, and, uh, and I think we shouldn't forget that, you know, you can accelerate things, but um, but you also need to be prepared to spend time on really trying to get a proper deep fundamental understanding of, of, of how things like viruses work. Um, it, 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 there's certain things you can do very quickly, but other things will, will take significantly longer to get the proper understanding. Sorry, that's a bit of a... No, no, I think it's, 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 it's an honest answer. And I think it, one can just look at HIV, how many years we have, everyone has been working on this. And, but, the, but with over, HIV, we have now a battery of, of right. drugs and, you know, it, is, it can be controlled. So these no, things no, do. Of course, but of course, there's no yet any vaccine, as far as I know. The first presentation is from Dr. John Wormsley, the chair of the ERIC Forum. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is John Womersley. I'm the Director General of the European Spallation Source, which, as you can see behind me, is a large scientific facility now under construction in southern Sweden. So greetings to you all from Lund and congratulations to Instruct uh, on this celebration. Instruct is a great example of how pan-European scientific collaboration can grow into something substantial, sustainable, uh, and with real scientific impact. Um, providing access to cutting edge capabilities and technologies uh, for structural biology across Europe. It began, as you know, as a collaboration between academic professors, and it then grew into a preparatory phase project that was considered as part of the ESFRI roadmap process. Uh, 
uh, becoming operational in 2012. And in 2016, it was made a landmark on the ESFRI roadmap. I chaired ESFRI at that time and coordinated the production of that, uh, that roadmap. And we were really pleased to see so many of the uh, research infrastructures that had been considered uh, for new pan-European initiatives making their way into sustainable and enduring funding at that time. Uh, and then Instruct went on successfully to become established as an ERIC, as a European Research Infrastructure Consortium, in 2017 uh, with a ceremony in London. That ensures a greater degree of sustainability and national support, and it ensures that Instruct is seen as an enduring part of the European research area and the European ecosystem of research capability. It also means that Enstruct is part of the ERIC Forum. I am the chair of the ERIC Forum, which brings together 21 existing research infrastructure consortia and some preparatory phase projects, covering an extraordinarily large range of disciplines from the arts and humanities uh, through biology, life sciences, uh, to astrophysics and um, uh, the, the kind of research that will be done here at ESS. Um, it's an opportunity in the ERIC Forum uh, to examine our shared experience as research infrastructures uh, and as users of this particular legal framework. Uh, and it's really good to know that the European Commission strongly supports the common positions that the ERICs have been able to take and really welcomes our input uh, into um, the development of European research policy. It's also particularly important it's been important for my project here, but also for Instruct, to know that UK participation in ERICS uh, is secure uh, and that the ERIC instrument has been incorporated into UK law. And as we all read um, uh, concerning news about uh, future UK participation in Horizon programs, I think um, it's great to know that the ERIC instrument and participation in ERICS as such remains secure uh, no matter what happens. So Instruct has played a great role in providing key services for structural biologists, but also more broadly uh, in helping to coordinate uh, and bring together the uh, research infrastructures in the life sciences domain, uh, ensuring that they can work closely together and to develop common tools, the RI Viz project for uh, enhancing visibility of research infrastructures is especially important and the RE platform, which has developed a common way of treating proposals, uh, will go on, I hope, to have a big impact across many other research infrastructures. Um, and of course, scientific collaboration. Uh, and right now, uh, with COVID-19 still very much in the news and work to develop effective treatments, the role of research infrastructures, both data infrastructures and access to uh, analytic capabilities is extremely important. Instruct has played a, a strong role in that, but so have many other ERICs and the ability of research infrastructures across Europe to work together in support of research on a short time scale is really a reminder of why this kind of research capability is absolutely essential. Now, looking forward, uh, we're now at the start of a new, um, a new framework program, Horizon Europe, and the work program uh, for that is being put together. And research infrastructures uh, can play and should play, must play a really important role uh, in that. But there are some new challenges. The budget for Horizon Europe is, uh, is currently under discussion, but the strong downward pressure uh, from many influential um, members of the, of the European community. And we are seeing the budget for research infrastructures uh, in particular uh, likely to be quite limited going forward. So we in the ERIC Forum have been thinking about ways that we can refresh and update the offering that research infrastructures make uh, to be timely, but also to be budget efficient. We've been having conversations with the European Commission, and these continue, about transnational access to research infrastructures, which is one of the key uh, offerings, uh, in ways that we could make that more outcome-based, uh, with a focus, uh, be it on the connection to the missions and challenges uh, that Horizon Europe um, foresees, 
uh, or perhaps to uh, ensuring uh, improvement in the diversity of the research community uh, or ensuring um, access for scientists from uh, member states where uh, research infrastructures are not so well developed uh, or which have not benefited so much um, from uh, research investment. Uh, so we could, we could imagine tailoring our access in, in particular ways to ensure greater impact. We could also uh, think about using uh, European Commission funding to secure matching funding from national sources. And this, I hope, would, uh, would enhance the sustainability uh, of many of our research infrastructures and make sure that the national commitments to the ERICs uh, are, are matched with real long-term funding commitments. And finally, the Commission is very keen on reducing bureaucracy. I think we, we can all uh, sympathize with that because the issuing of grants in Horizon Europe will be handed outside the Commission to a new executive agency, and that's likely to result in uh, less manpower being very available and a need to streamline the application and review process. We also need to continue the, uh, the never-ending task of raising awareness of research infrastructures and what we do and our importance uh, uh, underlying the broader research ecosystem. Research infrastructures can and do transform the way science is done by providing access to capabilities beyond what any single university group uh, could provide. But we're also looking forward uh, at ways that we can transform access to data by making data fair uh, accessible, reusable, and open through the European Open Science Cloud, uh, the, the data-intensive research infrastructures uh, that, um, that for much of, of the ERIC Forum can have a real impact on the way that science is done, taking us away from a publication-dominated model to one where scientific data is the currency, uh, what we publish and what we use and what we um, take pride in. We can also uh, take, uh, take a role as strengthening the European research area more broadly. Uh, distributed research infrastructures with nodes in many, many countries can provide pillars of scientific excellence and innovation potential all across Europe. Uh, and we can also deliver solutions to pressing problems. COVID-19 is just one example, but the challenges of climate, the environment and aging population have not gone away and they need to be addressed. And most of them require scientific and technical innovation and a broad interdisciplinary approach. And that's where research infrastructures have a great contribution to make. Research infrastructures and the establishment uh, of this um, broad domain uh, of activity across all of Europe, linking together national research nodes and national researchers, is one of the real achievements of the European research area. It's something really different compared to the landscape as it was 10, 15 years ago. And I think we can all be very proud of the way that we have helped to shape and change the way that research is done in Europe, one scientist, one researcher at a time. Uh, Instruct is a key part of that, and as this event is by nature something of a celebration, I think we should all celebrate what research infrastructures in general, and Instruct in particular, have been able to achieve over the last decade, and look forward to the coming decade uh, with excitement, with pride, uh, and with optimism about the way that we can continue uh, to shape the European scientific landscape for the benefit of all of our citizens. Thanks very much, and congratulations. Great. I, I, I want to thank John. I, I'm not sure he can hear us, but his presentation, I think, gave a really clear overview of the importance of research infrastructures in Europe and how far they've come over the last decade. It's just terrific. So our, our next uh, speaker is uh, Professor Lucia Banchi from Florence. She is the uh, Deputy Director of Instruct, and she'll be speaking on the impact of, uh, of Instruct, Eric, on the Horizon Europe uh, emissions. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot. And uh, uh, thanks for all what has been presented and commented up to now. It's really great to, to see some flashes on the achievement of Instrat. And uh, there will be many other uh, achievements that has, could be presented. I hope I have other occasions to present, uh, for example, the role of NMR that is really a unique technique to look at uh, dancing molecules in the cell and there are examples of how after uh, 15 years uh, from uh, the, that discussion we are now able really to look at these uh, molecules dancing in uh, in the cell 
But what I would like to focus today is, as I was in the, in the title of the presentation, as was discussed in the organization of this, is how would be the future and how would uh, instruct Eric, the role of instruct Eric within uh, the new uh, framework program and so Horizon Europe and specifically on the missions. And I think uh, there is no need uh, to uh, discuss and to comment about uh, the role of uh, research infra infrastructure on the European uh, level at worldwide that is relevant, uh, their impact, uh, their um, role that is absolutely essential and how they are essential for scientific excellence and for innovation. And this is another important point that we should stress, uh, the role of infrastructure in, in innovation. And as free, really acknowledge the uh, strategic role of infrastructure uh, in the European scene as well as worldwide. And Horizon Europe uh, has put uh, beside the issue that Roberta mentioned the reduction in, uh, in the budget or so, but uh, has put uh, the role and the relevance of, of the infrastructure uh, even more central with respect to the past. And so it gives uh, the uh, research infrastructure a, a mission, if you want, uh, to contribute uh, to science in Europe. As Roberto already presented, I mean, the scheme of Horizon Europe is, is built over three pillars, uh, excellent science, uh, global challenges, and innovation in Europe. And definitely, Instrata can contribute to all these three pillars and particularly the, the, the global challenges, uh, Instrata can have a strategic role in health and in food as well. That is an important point. And uh, uh, you might already know, because uh, this is already well known, this uh, uh, pillar two, the global challenges, have been uh, organized in terms of mission. And so mission area that are on specific uh, um, subject and the concept of the mission is actions is just to address some specific topic which should be um, analyzed and should have the resources and the efforts by scientists in, uh, in Europe and abroad uh, all the world, and particularly by e research infrastructures. Not a single one, but the research infrastructures should coordinate not only in terms of scientific domains or S3 domains, but also in terms of uh, uh, services that uh, they can provide in a coordinated, integrated way to address uh, this uh, specific uh, uh, area and specific mission, the specific challenges. And within uh, health, so the grand challenge of health, the uh, uh, European Commission has an identified cancer, so then the mission is combating cancer. And uh, another area, there are these uh, five uh, missions area. And as I mentioned, another area uh, mission that uh, to which uh, INSTRAT can contribute is about soil health and food and related to food. And I, I think that the INSTRAT, Eric, can uh, give a contribution to these missions at the two different levels, the two uh, um, complementary levels. One is uh, directly the contribution from the um, structure, from structural biology, the structural biology community and the tools and the expertise and the um, research as a structural biologist. And the other is that we can contribute to a much wider scientific community, research community, because we can provide access to structural biology techniques that can contribute to do excellent science addressing this research. So it could be our contribution to this mission and our services to the broad scientific community to address this, uh, this um, areas and mission. Uh, cancer, the mission, and I would like to present some examples regarding what we, what structural biology can do 
on these uh, uh, missions. So cancer, that is, uh, there are uh, a very interesting uh, intern report by the uh, board, uh, mission board for the various uh, missions. And um, obviously what they stress uh, beside the treatment of cancer, but the first point and the ground on which everything it builds on is understanding. So we need to understand the uh, biological processes. We need to understand how the cancer interact, the cell interact with the host. And only in this way, we can uh, uh, address and, and uh, tackle. So only if we understand, we can, um, address uh, this issue. And um, these are uh, uh, some examples on which uh, um, uh, to topics on the areas on which uh, instructor can contribute uh, because can contribute to understanding the uh, origin of, of uh, cancer and how the, the different components and cell and therapeutics interact. It can contribute uh, to prevention. Uh, can work on a vaccine against the oncogenic viruses or contrast agents for a very early diagnosis and obviously can contribute to the treatment because can both design and optimize uh, drugs but also can understand why, uh, why the, how they work and like, how they can uh, be implemented. And I, I think it's very uh, important and, and nice to notice uh, that up to now, so within Horizon 2020, so not in Horizon Europe where there are this concept of mission, already uh, about 30% of the proposals received by Instrateric are focused on cancer research. So this is already a, a real a con a concept within uh, the European scientific community that cancer is really a strategic mission in research. And already Instrat has provided support. Obviously, having this uh, scheme of missions uh, will stimulate many more applications, both to the infrastructure as well as uh, projects. Here, I pick up a few, few examples of already Publish already res, uh, existing results, published results from some uh, INSTRAT uh, centers which address the uh, aspect of, uh, uh, of cancer. And uh, this is, comes uh, from uh, Grenoble, from the uh, INSTRAT uh, France uh, to INSTRAT center, where they exploited the cryo-M structure to understand the virus human receptor interactions. And this is strategic for optimizing and developing optimized cancer uh, virotherapy. So this is a real towards in understanding, but also in terms of treatment. This comes from, from Florence, from the Italian Instrat Center. And in this case, um, NMR has been exploited to uh, characterize a um, biological uh, drug, anti-cancer drug, which has been pegylated. And this is a, a normal approach in order to prevent the, uh, the disruption, uh, the breaking of the, this biological drug by our immune system. But that if you um, decorate this molecule with the PEG molecules, then obviously there are no many techniques which allow you to, to do a characterization and to um, monitor whether the uh, conformation and the properties of this uh, drug is maintained. And this uh, through a combination integrated uh, approach of uh, solution and, and solid state NMR together with uh, X-ray and modeling, then they, they arrive to very detailed characterization of, uh, of this uh, biological drug. And this is a general aspect and the NMR has been uh, uh, defined as the gold standard technique for the characterization of biological drug. And this is uh, um, this has been defined by the National Institute of Standard Technology in the US, as well as of the European Medicine Agency. So for the higher order um, uh, analysis, uh, higher order structure analysis, uh, that this has been um, 
define has the technique to, to be used. Uh, I think Ian will talk about nanobodies after, but I thought that was a very, another very good example. This comes from the Instruct Belgium uh, Center on nanobodies where the uh, uh, nanobodies were used uh, to uh, characterize um, uh, the structure properties uh, uh, of a, a possible analgesic. So that uh, this is uh, towards uh, treatment because also analgesic is an important aspect uh, in terms of cancer, addressing cancer. Uh, so these are just a, a few uh, pick up example of what has been done up to now and that definitely most has to come. Another aspect is uh, that usually within Instructor we talk a little bit less uh, is about uh, food. And this is a key aspect uh, and this indeed has been identified as another mission area by the European Commission. And then again here there is a very interesting inter interim report uh, and the way they state, I mean, there is the problem of the health of the soil that obviously is reflecting the food and is reflected both in the food production and quality of the food. And so these are very important uh, uh, points, aspects uh, that can be um, addressed uh, and uh, here Again, structural biology can have multiple roles. So this is a matter of our imagination, our, our creativity as scientists. But already there are examples from uh, the Czech Republic Instructor Center, SciTech, uh, where they characterize uh, the uh, potato virus uh, um, coat protein they, uh, the, through cryo -EM, did the structure of this. And this is a very important important issue to understand the, the infectivity of this virus because this affects the, the uh, crops, uh, potato crops. You can, can you imagine uh, at the um, food level, this is a major uh, threat and that is a very important point that it should be addressed. And so then from the structure, uh, the characterization they understand about the infectivity of this virus, so the mode of infectivity, and uh, they understand it because they produce, characterize also virus like particle, how they can be used uh, as a scaffold for nanobiotechnology applications, so that uh, there is also a relevance in, uh, in innovation uh, in Europe. And uh, the, the last example I took uh, from uh, um, Instrat UK Ashbury Center, where they uh, characterize another virus uh, uh, for plant, uh, the Germany viruses, that is really uh, very uh, common and distributed to many, many types of uh, plants uh, from maize, uh, cotton, tomatoes. So then they're spread all over the world in different continent. And again, uh, the detailed characterization of this and how this uh, uh, dimerize and uh, how is the structure is um, the, the allow to understand the mechanism of violence and the to is a starting point for any specific action. So then with this, I close and I thank you for your attention. I hope I give you a flavor of what we can do in the future. So we had to, I mean, the, the European Commission program will build up on these missions and really we have to reinforce and to show our impact and our contribution towards these missions. Thank you. Lucia, thank you very much for both this extremely good overview and then the specific examples which I think show very clearly the impact of Instruct on the European, on European science. It was very interesting. So our next speaker is uh, Professor Jan Seyart from the uh, uh, Brussels Center. He's the director of the Brussels, the Belgium Instruct Center. I remember that Belgium was one of the first uh, countries to apply to be a member of Instruct before, uh, after the initial founding members. And we had to set up a procedure and it was a complicated and very carefully done procedure, but part of it was a site visit. And I remember I was selected to go on the site visit to see the nanobody center that uh, 
that uh, Jan had set up, and I was extremely impressed with it. And that time, at that time, no one knew much about it. So I think we'll we'll hear from Jan about his work, which will be um, on positioning Instruct Eric as a scientific um, influencer. Jan, please. Excellent. So I had the pleasure to participate in the very first discussions of the landscape analysis group. And, and then based on these discussions, I would like to reflect a little bit on the future of structural biology and on, on the future of Instruct. And, and, and you can uh, summarize just a few slides I will present in, in four words from explanatory, that's a terrible word for a non-native speaker, to exploratory. So um, if, if you would define integrated structural biology today, you would possibly explain it as a complex puzzle which once composed produces superstructures of large macromolecule, macromolecular assemblies at atomic resolution. However, uh, I mean, this uh, currently structural biology is still at the end of, of the discovery pipe, pipeline, but, but there are quite some, some pitfalls. And, and, and I will just uh, summarize a few of them. Today, we are mostly working with recombinant cloning and expression. And that means that we are often using single domains, missing other domains, missing IDPs, also missing key post-translational post modifications. We are still purifying our proteins, so that means that often we have tags associated with our proteins. Are we dealing with the right physiological conditions? Do we have all the cofactors in place? Uh, proteomics, do we have all the weak transient uh, interactors in place if we look at protein-protein interactions? Physiology, are we dealing with the right cell type for a particular disease indication? Uh, are, are we adding the right drugs or the, the, the right uh, cofactors again to, to look at a particular protein for a particular disease indication? So we, are, we, we made tremendous progress with structural biology, but there are still a number of pitfalls. And um, what, what, what we see now is that uh, uh, this is essentially still explanatory structural biology. We are trying to explain uh, observations that other people made uh, before. And, and this is uh, changing these days. The order is changing because uh, these days, we start to discover new biology first at atomic resolution to be addressed later on in the next stages by other disciplines. So uh, we see more and more examples where we first solve structures in a really uh, early discovery stage and functional studies and also uh, biological studies, context studies follow later on. So this is turning around the whole uh, situation where we are at the beginning of the discovery pipeline rather than at the end of the discovery pipeline. So, and I call this exploratory structural biology. And we have a few very nice examples. For example, the work of Scherer and Gudert. I mean, these guys just took uh, ex vivo tau filaments from, from patients suffering from different diseases and, and, and they really discovered that in fact the structures of these amyloids are, are significantly different. So in this case it, it's really a, a, an exploratory uh, a position that has been taken by, by the structural biologists. So uh, I think we, we, we will move towards this exploratory structure of biology in the future. And I just want to end my very short uh, contribution by, by, by summing up a number of challenges and also opportunities of, of, of exploratory structural biology. Unbiased samples will be a key issue. I mean, getting rid of the uh, of, of, of tax, uh, getting all the modifications, uh, uh, in situ and ex, and, and ex vivo structural biology, uh, taking into account the real biological context, uh, organelles, membranes, lipid rafts, modifications, physiological states. 
the conformational challenge. I mean, we have been mistrained uh, because we have always seen structures that are static, but in reality, we know that these things are extremely dynamic and, and adding the fourth dimension, I think, uh, no, the conformation is a key point and the four dimension time resolved work will also be a huge challenge uh, in structural biology in the future. Other macromolecules, we tend to forget about RNA, sugars, lipids. I mean, they are difficult to study, so we, we, we stick to our proteins, but, but these partners are key to biology as well. And, and, and fine, uh, resolution is a key point. And when we see, for example, in CRIEM that we, we are reaching real atomic resolution, and this will be really crucial if we want to make the difference in, in drug discovery and drug design. And finally, uh, closing the gap between atomic resolution, what we do, and, and the cellular resolution, the revolution in, in, in microscopy is also, I think, a huge challenge and, and also offers huge opportunities towards what I call exploratory structural biology. Um, in, in terms of technology, uh, we also uh, face some challenges, sample preparation linked to unbiased samples, sample size, there we are lucky, we only need, we need a few molecules uh, uh, to do cryem, for example, and a few, it is a relative word, but compared to crystallography, I mean, sample size is reduced dramatically. Uh, I think CRISPR-Cas uh, is, is, is still a challenge, but, but also offers huge offer opportunities for, for, for structural biology, single cell work, microfluidics. I mean, um, are we, will we be able to do structural biology at the level of proteins purified from a single cell? We will need microfluidics for that. New technologies, tomography, XL, what else? Uh, and, 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 and mostly the computational biology and artificial intelligence. I think there are still huge opportunities uh, if, if, if we look at structural biology from, from the other end, uh, from uh, the computational biology end. Brings me almost to my last slide, the operational challenges and opportunities, synchrotrons, how to coordinate access so that we can optimize their usage access to high-end microscopes, access to ultrafield and MR spectrometers, data storage management, deposition, dissemination, and preservation. So I think there are quite some challenges, but mostly opportunities, and, and that we will move towards exploratory uh, structural biology. I, I would like to end with, 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 a, with a more a pro provocative statement, and, and, and that's the following one. Uh, we are experiencing a dramatic change in our field where structural biology is gradually losing its state of privileged seclusion. I mean, the, the ivory tower position to become like what happened to molecular biology and that's practiced now in virtually all areas of biology. And indeed, we see that structural biology is, is, is really invading in, 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 in all, all different areas of biology and in all different area, in, in, in all papers that, 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 that really reach high impact. So whether it's a challenge or an opportunity, I mean, that, that's in your hand, but, but, but I strongly believe that uh, one of the solutions to, to, to remain uh, frontline with structural biology will be uh, to, to indeed focus on exploratory structural biology. So I thank you to, to give me these few minutes to, to, to give uh, my vision of structural biology. I'm Jan from Brussels, Zipsuk, and Instruct. Thank you all for your attention. Jan, uh, thank you very much for this very uh, forward-looking presentation and this final question, which I think hopefully will be discussed somewhat in the panel. But I really think some of the other points you've raised are really crucial to look at where structural biology will be going in the near future. Great. Uh, we will have now a panel discussion. We have some questions already raised, uh, uh, one from uh, Gopal B. To all panelists, is there a roadmap of how countries outside EU could join in this effort? Some discussion on prerequisites and expectations would be nice. Two, any thoughts on how the momentum on current problems, COVID-19, could be effectively followed up 
long after the, the felt need, the current need is, is completed. Therapeutic interventions sometimes need years. So if someone would like to comment on this question from Gopal. Well, uh, maybe, maybe I can start out. Um, so I think um, we've heard from a number of uh, sources that increasingly it's important for research infrastructures to have involvement of international partners. Um, and so we have in Instruct started to, to outreach to various regions around the world to establish collaborations uh, and in some cases to, to start a so, an association in terms of small pilot projects. We don't have a roadmap per se for international members, um, but really this has been driven on a case by case basis. Uh, uh, according to the, uh, the current status of structural biology in one of these international countries and what their expectations are and, and uh, their interest in, in a, a, some kind of association with Instruct. So uh, I think that will probably continue to be the case um, that, that we will look to identify particular interest from countries uh, that will probably start from scientific collaboration in the first instance and then develop into a more national interest uh, and a negotiation with, with Instruct to, to further that collaboration. And we're always very happy to hear from uh, these countries uh, and talk to them and see uh, how we can interact in a meaningful way. Thank you, Susan. There's a follow-up question, and this is for Stephen Burley, who's a chairman of the Instruct Scientific Advisory Committee. Should Instruct expand its international activities to allow it to exchange fully important research challenges? In what emphasis should, should you put on this? So you... uh, thank you for the question. I don't think it's my place to um, uh, determine um, how, in, how Instruct should um, expand its international activities. We already saw evidence in some of the presentations uh, earlier that um, Instruct is in fact engaged in, uh, in a number of different um, ex, uh, European uh, collaborations. Uh, I believe that work is going on in uh, South America right now, uh, as well as the, uh, the interactions with, uh, with Australia. Um, the through groups like Elixir, uh, etc. There's a lot of open data sharing that goes goes beyond the borders of of Europe, uh, and the Worldwide Protein Data Bank, which the uh, the U.S. Uh, RCSB Protein Data Bank is part of, uh, of course, is is uh, very pleased to be contributing to that effort. Uh, I, but uh, perhaps uh, perhaps Dave uh, should. Um, address the issue of um, of international outreach. I'm all for it as the advisory board chair, but that may not mean anything. Thank you, Stephen, for your frank comments. Dave, would you like to comment on this? Uh, well, I think Maria has her hand up. Okay, Maria. Yeah, um, I'm very much in favor of internationalization, mainly outside the, the European boundaries as I've uh, said or demonstrated before in many meetings. However, I think that we should also consider, or instruct should also concentrate in many European countries which are not yet members. I, as far as I know, Austria, for instance, has been trying to become a member for many years and I don't know why, but has not reached an agreement yet. Yet, and there are, I feel, I should say that from countries without cutting edge technologies like Portugal, I'm not including Austria on that, but uh, there are other countries that uh, would benefit tremendously of becoming members of this drug, as we are benefiting from Portugal. And I think this is a mutual benefit from members of this country in terms of having access these new technologies and uh, new collaborations, but also from these more advanced countries and widening their scientific questions and their relationships and their, their interactions with other scientists. So I think ISM, Instruct has done a fantastic job and uh, 
we should look outside Europe, but we should also look inside Europe because there are many countries that should provide users or, or benefit users, but also provide all the technologies, advanced countries which are not yet or have evaded to become members of respect for many years, so to speak. Thank you, Maria. Grand. So we have a different question, which I think is quite a pressing issue from Giorgio Rossi. There is a high potential of research infrastructures to contribute to missions, but this changes the access mode from curiosity-driven excellent proposals by individual groups towards delivery, parentheses also, close parentheses, scientific services that require adequate scientific staff at the facilities. This transi transition in operations must be addressed. Less investment required by the reduced mobility, higher investment in manpower required for managing remote access and mission-oriented research demands. Basically, to find funds for the top-end research scientists to man the facilities. Would someone on the panel like to comment on this question, which I think is really crucial and has been um, one of the hallmarks of Instruct? Well, I, I can just say a couple of words while, while people uh, gather their thoughts. I think that's a, it's a very interesting question. And as um, Jan, Jan was saying, the sort of with the increasing reach, there's going to be new communities. There's going to be different modes of access. There's going to be uh, different, the different ways of running these things. And uh, uh, it's, it's going to, it, it is going to be a, it, it's a significant change. And I think it's, very easy for infrastructures to underestimate the uh, the extra sort of resources required to run in that uh, much more sort of uh, hands-on way where the, the people in the infrastructure have to deliver much more of the experiment. Um, I, but I think there are there are certain areas uh, of structural biology where that is is, is anyway sort of happening and. And I think, to be honest, structural biology has been one of the leading sciences in, in moving towards uh, better uh, remote access, re automated data collection, require, requiring less expertise from the users. That initially with uh, X-ray crystallography, uh, synchrotrons being one thing, um, and, and now electron microscopy uh, it can, be, can be done remotely. A related question which we could ask. This is from a, an early stage researcher, Eleni Yonu, Yanu. For an early stage researcher like myself, who is not experienced in structural biology, but interested in training and development, the traditional way to access new technologies is to rely on local networks and or existing collaborations instead of reaching out to a consortium like Instruct Eric. What do you think is our the benefits of getting involved with Instruct Eric instead of a traditional collaboration with individual research groups? And what is Instruct's strategy for communication engagement of new users? It is, and as a continuation to the comment that was shared just before, it is more of a source of inspiration to have access to large scale facilities, including Instruct centers. So in that sense, I would not first of all uh, think that it is only a a specific network of people that you should know if it is to perform research and this is why we in Greece also are trying for several years to become full members of Instruct Eric and in this sense it's like that every young scientist and not young as well will have the opportunity to have access to cutting-edge technology and uh, there is no need to have a, an already established network if it is to perform excellent research. And talking about that as well, it's more of a source of inspiration and not a kind of obstacle for curiosity-driven research in the sense that you have the opportunity to see how much you can achieve and perform frontline research by collaborating with people at uh, instructoric centers. So this is rather crucial because I think that unless there are some exceptions, I mean, most of the scientists are not born excellent. So you become excellent. And Instruct actually has provided this as being the incubator for a next generation of scientists. So I believe that Eleni and the rest of young scientists across Europe and beyond 
uh, Europe as well, it is uh, an amazing opportunity that uh, has to be exploited. As long as uh, Instruct Eric and the rest of the S3s as well manage to uh, convince the national authorities whether it is, uh, not whether, that about the importance to invest on the participation of the different member states. Okay, thank you very much for this comment. Maria, please. Yeah, can I add to Evangelia? I, I think that uh, to these new and not yet uh, experienced users, one could say that um, you will gain for sure much more through Instruct than through your local or known collaborations. So just come out and try to and go from new experiences and new collaborations because for sure at the end you will feel recompensated by doing that, having that attitude. I agree with you 100% on this. There's another question which is a different area. In the broad, this is from an anonymous person. In the broad structural biology community, academic, pharmaceutical, manufacturing, technical, data, what is the most important indicator of success for Instruct Eric? Eric, are you, are you online? Possibly you might want to address this. Yeah, 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 is that okay? It's yeah, okay. It's fine. Um, my, my feeling is that uh, we, we don't have to look for numbers, but my, my feeling is that uh, Instruct best um, evaluation of success, the, its agility. That is uh, being able to, to attract new members, being able to tackle new problems, being able to, to develop in various fields, to, to, be, to be able to, to address new technologies. And for me, the success of Eric, of the instructor, Eric, would be agility again, because this is very important. And uh, instructor Eric is probably at the front line in this field among the various AI I know. It has demonstrated, uh, and it's still demonstrating, and it will be demonstrating later, its capability to, to evolve rapidly. And this would, uh, will uh, satisfy most of the users from the academy, from the industry, from uh, et cetera, because it will adapt to their needs and uh, missions and problems, et cetera. Okay, I, fine. Uh, anyone else like to comment on that question? Maria, again, please. <laughs> I can say something. I think uh, from what we've heard today of advances of sciences and also the future challenges presented by Jan, Jan I think we can envisage that, that I mean, that, that, that the indicators out of the use of this track will be uh, very high in the near future. So I think the best indicators of all are the results and the quality of the results. And the few examples that we've heard today can really influence us uh, uh, towards uh, a better use and a better spread of this drug. Okay. So this is, I think, somewhat difficult and tricky question from Jan uh, Donalek from, uh, from Prague. The service mode availability of our techniques is creating an increased pressure on good training of one central lab staff, two users, three young scientists. This means training is still broader numbers of techniques. Should we train these multi-technique super scientists or just have people really specialize and let the facilities do the rest? Should Instruct push more in this area to help especially young scientists get good grasp of the available techniques. Increasingly people use, but not understand too much the background, which may cause applications and interpretation faults and problems. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the training uh, is uh, a, a key point and that is uh, strategic at different level because uh, it contributes not only to the scientists that to know how to um, acquire the best uh, the uh, experiments and to perform the experiments, but also on how the um, scientific questions uh, should be um, 
polls and they should be organized in such a way that the, the people can set up at best the, the scientific project, because this is another important point. I mean, the, the training on the usage of the technique is an aspect that it can be somehow addressed and the user can be helped by the uh, technical staff of the, of the various facility and platform, but also is, is needed that the uh, uh, knowledge uh, of the potentiality and of the critical aspects of the various techniques in such a way that when you have a scientific problem, you can set up uh, the overall project at the best, uh, exploiting uh, the best technique for the specific question on depending on the type of system. So I think that uh, Instrata has uh, an a extensive uh, training program and they is uh, working a different, uh, um, with this different type of services, I think is very important and very effective. So Instrata is organizing uh, courses that now uh, we are discussing open a call for uh, uh, online courses because of problem of uh, uh, moving uh, within uh, Europe or uh, within the world, so the, most of the people are not traveling. Uh, or otherwise, there are hands-on project program um, courses, and also use organizing internship that also it allows a young researcher to go to one of the instruct center and acquire uh, expertise on a given center, a given technique, sorry. Great. I, I think this is an aspect of, of Instruct which has been yeah. mentioned before and, and, and you're chairing this committee is very important. Um, there are addition, of course, interns that travel and when they travel to another site, they often get intense training. training yeah. and I think the problem is quite serious and, and uh, we, we will have to address it. I'd like to thank all of the speakers and participants and panelists, as well as all the participants for taking part in this meeting. I'd like to thank in particular Dave and Susan, the director and coordinator of Instruct for everything they've done, as well as the entire staff at the Hub. I cannot name all the people. I think this session uh, showed a lot of the results of what Instruct has done over the last decade and more. It shows the challenges but it also gives a feeling for the future directions, which look incredibly fascinating for all of us. And I think there's a wonderful future for structural biology. And I think for Instruct Eric. So thank you. And, and if I forgot someone, I, I apologize. Great. So I think we can end the session now. And, and again, thanks everybody. Be well. Bye-bye.